Yay. <laughs> so nice to see so many of you here. Uh, pretty, a couple of new faces. Everyone that hasn't been here before, up with your hand. I want to see. So now you know where we learn stuff about Asher. So welcome. I and mean, please continue to join. Uh, we're going to hear Jeffrey speak. We have a small agenda. Uh, so what is this user group about? Learning, networking, having fun. You don't have to have any prior experiences with Azure or compute or stuff in general. Just come and enjoy people. Uh, we're almost 1,400 members. 13, 1,352, so soon 1,400. <laughs> uh, it's us that makes uh, these events happen. Please connect with us on LinkedIn uh, or other places on web. If you have any ideas, you can come to us. If you would like us to do something differently, if you want to speak, if you have suggestions, anything, please reach out. Uh, you can follow us on multiple places, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, all of these, most of our sessions are on YouTube. I would say 95% of, of everything we've done is on YouTube. So it's a good place to check us out. Thank you to Foo Cafe. It wouldn't be possible without them. And thank you, Capiche, if you want to say something. He's paying for the pizza. Yeah. Uh, don't tell anybody, it's my boss who does. <laughs> uh, okay, very well, welcome. And another time we see that it's packed here at Food Cafe. Good job, Michael. Uh, Capish, we uh, are a software company, 100 meters in that direction. We have used uh, Microsoft and other tools to build a graph database motor that's really good for uh, exploring scientific data. So if you're really interested and curious about cause and analysis, that's the way to go with Capish. Unfortunately, right now, we are not looking for either uh, front-end or full-stack or back-enders. But please add us on your LinkedIn view list because it's, uh, uh, after summer, we think there will be some great pos new positions. Over and out. Perfect. So, we do these events almost uh, one a month. Last year, we may, we were able to do 13 events last year. Our, there's a small post on our LinkedIn site about it, some, some fun stuff. Uh, we don't have anything planned for February, but it will happen, I think. The, in March, we will have a global AI bootcamp event. In February, it's the global Asia one, and then, you know, we'll just keep on pushing out events. So, if you want to participate, if you want to hold a session, if you have an idea, request or something, grab us during pizza time and let us know. Uh, yeah, this is where you could submit sessions if you like. We have a Discord. There's, there's some stickers and the QR is also on the table over there if you want to join that one. And with that, I want to hand it over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you. I guess everyone can hear me, right? Cool. I just need to connect my computer. So, I should have had a, a slide about me, I suppose. But uh, I'm Jeffrey. I'm a technical specialist at Microsoft Denmark. Um, I've been with Microsoft for one and a half year. And, and before Microsoft, I was a consultant at Deloitte, uh, doing primarily data warehousing and talking about data architecture and also doing some application development for uh, public sector and uh, FSI also, uh, financial institutes. So today I have the pleasure of uh, presenting Fabric to you guys. Uh, how many of you know Microsoft Fabric? Ooh, how many have worked with Microsoft Fabric? 
Yeah. One. <laughs> okay, it's fine. It's so totally fine. It's so new. It's also new to me. Um, but before I start about talking about fabric, I just want to set the scene so we are all aligned about what is happening around us. So let's talk about the data reality of today. So I guess you kind of already know that AI is everywhere and um, it's actually on everyone's agenda. Businesses all around, are, or I would say people, are actually expecting these kind of services. How many of you have been going to a website now, just trying to chat with the bot, seeing if, if it's intelligent or dumb? Okay, I tried that recently on IKEA and it was like, I want, I, I'm looking for this fabric for my couch platform, just to create new data experiences. And right now, uh, when I'm out talking with, the, with people, um, CROs, yeah. um, then we're seeing that CROs are trying to scrape all the data they have on their data platforms just to see what kind of things they can do with it. But as we all know, well, my, my boss used to say crap in, crap out, but I, I, I hope you get the point. AI is not a magic wand. Um, the quality of your data is only as good as it is. Another fact is that as a data engineer, I'm a data engineer by certification, let's say that, but there's actually more than 1,300 different services a data engineer has to think about when they're making their own data pl platform. And that's quite a lot. Integration of these are often very fragile and expensive to make. And it's often because they're coming from different providers that have locked the data into their own preparatory formats. And this makes it really hard to try and onboard new services because e each time you have to think about, okay, who's going to pay? Who's going to do all these integrations? So it makes it an effort that is not really scalable. And that hinders our ability to innovate and adapt to the market. So for the last two years, Microsoft has been trying to reimagine how uh, their ad analytics portfolio could ever since. Oh, did I just... Yeah, okay. So, so what is Microsoft Fabric? Uh, I have four, four words, I could say, or four pillars on how to describe what Fabric is. So it's a complete analytics platform. It's lake-centric and open. It empowers every uh, business users, and of course, it's AI-powered. Everything is AI-powered now nowadays. Let's see if this works. Laser pen, yes. <coughs> so with Fabric, um, you get all the capabilities you need to deliver and manage a, a data product from an end-to-end -end perspective. So of course, we have capabilities of ingesting, I mean, getting data into the data platform. We have different services, like if you're, if you're a data engineer, you would probably like to use a, a, a notebook, or if you're a data warehouse specialist, you would like to use a data warehouse to transform your data, bringing data from one state to another. And that is something we can do with these free services. Then we also have uh, now uh, integrated capabilities of, of dealing with real-time data, so data that comes really, really fast. We can transform it and, 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 and integrate or ingest it in, into the platform. And then, of course, Power BI. Uh, I hope most of you know Power BI, but Power BI is typically the tool we use to present the data we have in our data platform, make reports and so on. And then we have a new product, uh, a new service in, in Microsoft Fabric that has never been uh, on the Azure platform, and that is Data Activator. And Data Activator, uh, in a nutshell, is a, is, a, is a sophisticated way of tr making triggers in, in Microsoft Fabric. Because doing reports doesn't create any value in itself, it's only when we're acting on data that it provides value. And that's why it's, it actually plays an essential uh, it plays a central role in, in, in your future data state. So, doing the preview, a preview in, in Microsoft means a beta version, you can say, of Microsoft Fabric. We had more than 25,000 25, different uh, organizations trying uh, our service. And most of them used more than three uh, different services in Microsoft Fabric. And if I'm just uh, being creative, I would say they probably use Data Factory to get the data into the platform, and then maybe they use the notebook or a data warehouse to, to transform and host their data, and maybe Power BI to show the data uh, in the data platform. I think that's 
the minimum three you, you, you should use at least. Fabric has not been here for a long time, uh, but every week they're actually announcing a lot of new stuff. Uh, so I'm also uh, keeping updating my slides. Uh, but every week um, they're actually pr uh, launching new features. And I don't know them all, but you can find it on our roadmap. And that's really different from what we in Microsoft has used to do, because uh, it used to be really cl uh, closed sourced, you, you I would say, and then sometimes they would say, okay, now you have all these features, but they're now really inspired by the Power BI way of being really transparent as of what they're investing their time on. And typically what they're investing their time on is things that the people have uploaded in the form of what they want of features. So there's also a way to make the services uh, relevant. So these are the four uh, things I will go through today, and hopefully after that you will have a sense uh, of what Microsoft Fabric can do for you. So, Microsoft Fabric, uh, re really interesting about Microsoft Fabric is the way they kind of standardize the way we work with data. It standardizes the core of how we work, but it's very flexible about how we use it. So, all teams will be working similarly, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel of how they are doing stuff. They don't have to, when they're going to a new project, they don't have to ask around, how do we do CICD in this department? How do we manage our data? Or how do we discover where the right data is? This is, this is gonna save us time, and this reduces the confusion every time we onboard a new project. Microsoft Fabric is really inspired by Power BI and the SaaS approach. And, and by SaaS, I mean software as a service. We are inspired by uh, the mantra in Power BI. Uh, they call it 555. That means really cheeky. But uh, five seconds to load and five seconds to wow. Uh, so that's, I think it is, is a great idea. Um, so that's what they're trying to aim. So what we see in Fabric is there will be minimum knobbing. And that means you have to, ca you have to do this tweaking uh, to get your data warehouse or your data uh, or your notebooks to run. We don't need to do all this needy greedy tweaking of uh, indexes, partitions, and so on. That is something we just, as, a, as an engineer, expect it to work behind the scenes. I don't want to deal with it. I just want to do my analytics so my business users can get happy. So the idea is we do all the plumbing behind the scenes while you can do what creates value for you. As you can imagine, there will be a lot of different people working in Microsoft Fabric. We will have data engineers doing their uh, data warehousing, data scientists doing their machine learning models, business intelligence people doing reports, and business analysts consuming the reports. So, we, so there will be a lot of different roles in my, uh, playing or using Microsoft Fabric, and that's why they've made uh, personas to optimize the way we interact with, uh, with Fabric. So when I'm a data engineer, I go into Fabric and say, I'm a data engineer, and I get displayed all the task or components that is relevant to me as a data engineer, not those from a data scientist. And then I have a small video, a short video showing just what Fabric is. I have to change to mouse. Okay, that's not how it works. data professionals can easily get started and collaborate in Microsoft Fabric. We're starting out on the Power BI homepage, which is the ideal environment for a BI analyst that wants to build data sets and reports. However, Fabric offers many persona-based experiences. I can easily navigate from Power BI to something like Synapse Data Science. We see the suggested items change to experiments and models, whilst the recommended materials focus on getting started with ML models. Since I'm a data warehousing professional, I'm going to navigate to the Synapse Data Warehouse experience. And let's get started by creating a new warehouse. All I have to do is give it a name and choose a sensitivity label, and I'm instantly navigated to the warehouse experience. I did not have to set up any clusters, networking, or storage accounts. As a first step, let's bring some data into my warehouse. I can navigate to my pipeline experience in a single click and can choose from many connectors that will bring data in at petabyte scale. 
I'm going to choose Azure SQL as my source, select all the tables I want to copy, specify column mappings, and that's it. I can now start copying my data. Navigating back to the warehouse, I can see my tables have been automatically created for me. I can explore my data by filtering it directly in the table view or writing my own SQL queries. Fabric experiences cater to both pro developers and low code users. In the warehouse case, this means that users can leverage a visual query editor for creating their queries. Users can use a graphical user interface, including the ability to do complex joins without ever needing to write any code. In Fabric, we have also combined the data warehouse directly with Power BI, making it really easy for data engineers and business analysts to collaborate over the same data. Here, I've got the built-in modeling view, where I can easily create relationships between all of my different tables. I can also use this experience to add new measures that I need for my BI model. And because these experiences are all integrated, we take care of performance tuning and keeping all the data in sync. Now with one click, I can create a Power BI report. I can see my tables, including my newly created measures. I can drag and drop my fields into the report. And I can see that my table has 30 million rows. I can now build out my Power BI report just like I normally would. Navigating back to the workspace, I can see my entire project is ready with my pipeline, warehouse, data set, and report. I can also see how everything comes together in the built-in lineage view. To conclude, Microsoft Fabric dramatically simplifies the process of building out end-to-end -end complex analytics projects. I was able to ingest data, build out my data warehouse and BI report, all without needing to configure any infrastructure or leaving the Fabric experience. Sorry about that. <laughs> so what you see here is they they're na mainly navigating or yeah navigating in the data uh, warehouse experience where they copy the data from some from some external source using a pipeline into Microsoft Fabric. Then they used uh, then they wrote some SQL queries that the SQL or data warehouse specialist uh, knows how to do. But they also offer another way of interacting with visual queries for those. Who maybe forgot how to make a uh, how to make a make a left join. Then they showed a semantic model how to do relations. I mean, showing the relation between the tables, um, and doing a a, a measure on uh, in Power BI. <coughs> and then of course they also showed how to to make Linux in in Microsoft Fabric. I, I think that's uh, they didn't show so well of how it how they did it. But w whenever we do something in Microsoft Fabric, Fabric kind of records what you do, so it, it can produce Linux of what is depending on what. So let's go over, yeah. Uh, let's take that in the Q&A session. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, one leg. So with Fabric, we all get one one leg. It's not like you can have two one legs that goes against the wording. So one one leg. Um, so think about one leg as as you have one drive, right? Right. One drive is the place for all your documents. Then you have one leg for all your your data. So that's how it, it's the default storage for for Microsoft Fabric, and it organizes uh, every er, all of the our uh, data is being organized by by Fabric uh, in a structured way, so you can see some predictability on where it stores its, its data. Um, it's automatically indexed out of the box, uh, so you don't have to think about partitions as, uh, uh, as we usually do uh, with other lake uh, applications. Then we have different engines in Microsoft Fabric. We have, of course, our, uh, our famous T-SQL engine that we use for, for SQL Server, and then we also have Spark that we know from Databricks. Uh, and then we have KQL that we, I don't know if it uses it, that one, but that's what we use for time series data. Uh, <coughs> it, it, it deals uh, with an enormous amount of data in real time. Uh, 
but all these engines have been optimized to use um, the open f uh, data format called uh, Parquet or Delta Parquet actually. And and the great thing about Parquet is it's it's open and portable. And by portable it means you can actually it's just a flat file. You can take it, put it in anywhere. So if you don't like it in Microsoft Fabric, you don't like Microsoft, they say that you can actually take your files and put it on somewhere else and use it without thinking about, oh, I'm locked down to Microsoft. So that's one thing that is really interesting about the approach they're taking with Microsoft Fabric. No longer do we need to uh, import data into the different engines. In the old days, when, 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 when I was a data engineer, I would probably ingest data from external sources into the, da uh, the data warehouse. Then I would uh, have to ingest it again when I've transformed it into Power BI to present it. And if I was a machine learning uh, data scientist, I also had to ingest it, copy the data into another service. With Fabric, you don't have to do that. All of engines can speak to the same file and work, uh, work against it. And that is really smart, because we don't have to do, do any complicated pipelines to transfer the latest data to the, to, the, to the other engine. That also means that changes are directly visible on the other engines. And then we have something called one security that, that is not in place yet, but it's coming. One security is really interesting because, in again, again, in the old days, we had to address security uh, and uh, access permissions on each of our level in our, in our data lake, in our data lake, not data lake, in our data platform. So again, from, uh, from the lake to the data warehouse, who can access that file? Uh, from the uh, from the data warehouse to, to the report layer, who can access these reports? Who can access this data? Now we can do it in one place uh, uh, in Microsoft Fabric, and we do it only once. And we we can do that because we address the security permissions on the data level itself. And then I have a video about okay that Microsoft Fabric is actually performing quite well. It's really fast. So in this video, they're actually showing how to load uh, 20 terabyte of data uh, into Microsoft Fabric uh, in just 15 minutes. I'm not going to bore you with that one. Just trust my words, it's, it's fast enough. And then this slide is just to emphasize again that we're working on the same data set in Fabric. So changes are reflected immediately. If you're, if you're a data warehouse uh, specialist doing something in, in a table, then the data scientists can see it immediately. They don't need to copy your data. And that, is, uh, that has its b benefits, of course, because no, no more do we have to think about, OK, do I have the most relevant copy? Do I have the latest copy? I just need one copy. And that's also why we call it one copy. But that's the idea comes from that one. And it's smart because it also saves you on cost. Less copies means less space storage. And then, of course, you only have one single source of truth now. You don't have multiple ones. And then again, a little short video. Operate on top of the same copy of data stored in the lake house. As a SQL analyst, I can navigate to the SQL endpoint that comes automatically pre-wired to my lake house with no setup needed. This opens up the warehouse UI, which is powered by our serverless SQL engine. This is a completely revamped warehouse experience. There's true separation of compute and storage, and the warehouse is fully optimized to work on top of Delta Parquet with excellent out-of-the-box performance. I can see all the familiar constructs to me, like my schema, stored procedures, views, and queries. As a next step, let's go ahead and write a SQL query to explore our data. To get started, I want to see how many rows of data I'm dealing with in my revenue table. Writing a quick query in the editor shows me I'm working with 3.5 billion rows of data, all stored in the lake. Let's write another query that looks at the sum of revenue and gross revenue across distribution channels and fiscal months. We're even going to query data across different lake houses and warehouses in our workspace, all in the same query. We can see the SQL query runs and returns a result almost immediately, scanning all the 3.5 billion rows of data and giving me my aggregated numbers. But taking a closer look, we can see it looks like I'm facing a data quality issue with my data. Instead of getting a channel name for one of my entries, I am getting what appears to be the GUID instead. I'm going to jump into a notebook and use Spark to fix the bug. 
we can see the link house is tightly integrated into the notebook experience, and I can just drag and drop my table onto the notebook and run them from there. Upon running the cell, the notebook uses serverless Spark life pools, meaning things start to run immediately. And in just a couple of seconds, I get a preview of my table. I'm now going to write some Spark code, replacing the GUID with the correct channel name. Once my notebook has finished running, I'm going to immediately rerun the same query in the warehouse. We can now see that the issue has been fixed and all the data appears correctly labeled in the table. Finally, the business analyst can also make use of the data in the lake house. I can simply navigate to the built-in modeling view and start developing my BI data model directly in the same warehouse experience. After all my data has been prepared, I can now move into creating a brand new Power BI report. As I open my report, I can see all the tables on the side, but no data has actually been loaded into Power BI at this point. This is just a pointer to Delta Parquet files stored in the lake. This is because Power BI now supports direct lake mode, which means it can natively read Parquet files directly in the lake at blazing fast speeds. Let's take a look. I'm going to start by dragging in the count of rows, and we can see that we have 3.5 billion rows of data in the revenue table. I'm now going to drag in the sum of revenue. I'm going to break it out by product type, and let's make things nice and big. And then I'll also add fiscal quarter to the legend, and finally change the chart type. And you can see everything is running so smoothly. And as I slice and dice my data, I get all the interactivity I would expect with instant response times. This volume of data would have taken hours to ingest using standard ETL tools. But with direct leak mode, users can now get the amazing performance of import mode without needing to load any data, managing refresh schedules, or worrying about latency. As a final step, we can take this even further and empower every Excel user to benefit from data stored in the lake house. Here I'm in Excel connected to the MS Sales Lake House, and I can easily build out a pivot table directly on top of the same data stored in the lake. To conclude, with Fabric, data engineers have a frictionless experience building out their enterprise data lake house and can easily democratize this data for all users and organization. <clears throat> so, so, so what you saw was actually uh, we are using here two different uh, fabric items we're using a data warehouse and a, 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 lake, a lake house and a warehouse uh, where these different two people can work together on the same data set. So a data engineer would probably work in the data warehouse doing some tables, some transformation, and then uh, the data scientist uh, using his notebooks or her notebook could work, uh, continue working on that one. And everything is then uh, used on a, on a hot cluster, so you actually don't have to wait uh, when, a, uh, when a cluster is assigned to you when you're doing your transformations. And then something I've, I'm still having a hard time to, 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 to understand, or not to understand, but, but to realize is that they're actually doing Power BI on flat files, like parquet files, uh, and they're dealing with 3.5 billion rows, that is like in Danish 3,5 milliarder rækker. Uh, when I worked on-premise on this, just when I hit above 1 billion rows, things would go really, really slow. And we, if I joined multiple things and do, did some crazy transformations, then it would never run. But, but they can do it. So I, I'm still amazed about that kind of facts. <coughs> Operate on top of the oh. same copy. And then taking uh, one copy to the next level. Yeah, that doesn't work like that. Um, but trust me, that, that's what it says up there. So we have something called shortcuts. And that is something that is typically really, uh, I mean, how many of you know about shortcuts in Windows? Yeah, OK, OK, uh, at least there's some Windows users here. But for those who don't know about shortcuts, it's like, when you have your files sa uh, saved on your documents folder and you want to have it shown in your uh, desktop folder, you can right click, create a shortcut and move it to, to a desktop. It's not copying your file, it's just a pointer of reference to that file located in another place. And we can do the same thing in, 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 in one 
in, my, in Microsoft Fabric now. So you can have your files in another lake. Let's say you can have it in, in Google Cloud, you can have it in Amazon. We can virtualize the, those files there as if it was natively stored in Fabric. And that makes it really interesting because now we can have one, uh, one lake as, as a hub for all your data. So you don't have to go different places that have different headaches about, oh, my data is located there. I cannot get it into Power BI. Then Databricks, have you heard about that one? Yeah? We have a lot of uh, customers also I in have invested heavily on Databricks, and they always ask me about, okay, I have used so much money on Databricks, do I have to migrate to Fabric? Um, you can, if you want to, but that's, uh, it's not an either or, actually. You can use both in the same in the, uh, at the same time, and that will work really, really well. So what you can do uh, if you invested heavily in Databricks, and that is the existing data lake um, that your Databricks is using, you can virtualize that into one lake using a shortcut, uh, like, like below here. You could also, I if, you, I if you want that, if you want to take more advantages of, of uh, Fabric, and that would be to refactor your notebooks, um, every place it, r it points towards the old data lake, you would point it towards uh, one leg instead. And that way you could benefit from one security where you only do uh, permission security permissions uh, one place, so you don't have to do it twice. Uh, with the other model, with shortcut, you, ha you have to address uh, permissions on Databricks itself, but also on in Fabric. And then another interesting thing uh, about uh, there will always be cons and pros with both approaches, um, but there's one one pro uh, I, I think I need to s uh, highlight with Fabric, and that is uh, we have something called V order, and that's the way we write our parquets. It uses a bit more compute power to write the parquet files, but you benefit a, a lot more when you're reading it. Um, so that's uh, uh, we that's how we c we manage to get Power BI working on these flat files. So. A standard CSV file, if you had your data in a CSV file, it, it, it for Microsoft sales data, it would take like 800 gigabyte. But if we, if we convert that to Parquet, it would be 268. But with our reorder compression, we could do it to 84. And that is really uh, interesting because that means we're actually using less compute power on our data set. And it also means our data t uh, uh, takes up less space. And that just means money in the pocket. <laughs> So just to highlight that <laughs> Fabric and, uh, and, and Databricks is not an either or, you can use it both. And actually it's not only Databricks that can be connected to, to Fabric, actually any application that, is, uh, that can talk lake through this, this API, or the, the Blob API, or anything that actually talks uh, Parquet can actually be part of this, um, this uh, this ecosystem. Actually, many are working on being part of this ecosystem. This is uh, we have uh, more than 100 partners currently working uh, to get their thing, their services or their offerings into uh, Microsoft Fabric. So you can actually, I, th I found this slide uh, internally, and I think it's really interesting. But you can think uh, Fabric as the operating system, Windows, and then you can think the experiences we had in Fabric as different apps. Um, in fabric uh, in, in our ecosystem and soon you will also be able to see these third party vendors having their different apps in in uh, in Microsoft fabric and this is uh, really exciting because just imagine you can buy climate data from Vistas so uh, data from another provider and then you can use their specialized engine to do some niche thing that that you don't have to develop yourself just as a service on fabric and combine it with your own data so now Big data is actually becoming uh, a bit easier to do. And that is just to highlight that other uh, ISVs are also uh, trying to get uh, to, to get be part of this ecosystem. And for those things that don't speak Parquet, uh, we have something called database mirroring. And that is maybe something that could be more interesting to you when you talked about link services. 
So with Fabric, uh, and this is something that is still in private preview, I expect it to be around uh, Q1 maybe. We would maybe see it in public preview. Um, but with Fabric, we can actually replicate a database um, to Fabric uh, without doing some ETL. No, we don't have to think about how to establish complicated CDC pipelines to get the newest data. That is something Microsoft does for you. Uh, you can choose if you want all, data all tables on your database or if you want specific tables. Um, and they have made uh, their own CDC connected to these databases down here, um, which they promise to, to have a minimal impact on the, on the, on the, on the compute. On, and of course, all, all the replicas are then saved in Parquet because Fabric is, is optimized to Parquet, so you don't have to worry about, okay, Cosmos is a NoSQL database, it's not optimized for analytics, but that is something we have then uh, taken care of for you. And that makes it a bit uh, interesting because suddenly you un unlock a, a different capabilities with this, cross querying across different uh, oper operational databases that you have not done any ETL on. You can suddenly do that live uh, in Microsoft Fabric. And it's very, very interesting, especially for data scientists, because they don't have to make, they don't have to figure out how to get their copy into the lake before they, they can explore the data, if they can make any predictive model uh, in there. So it, it significantly speeds up the, w the way of, of working with data. And of course, there's this added bonus that uh, because everything is for K, well, then you can actually um, connect Power BI to these data, to these parquet files, and see what you uh, make reports on your operational data actually. And this is then the roadmap. Uh, there's more to come, but these are, are the things we expect in Q1, at least. And and, and something that's maybe uh, I f I think is really interesting because I worked a lot with on-premise, and that is they also aim to do it for on-premise on SQL servers. Dataverse, have you heard about Dataverse? Um, Dataverse, for those who don't know, Dataverse, we, uh, we have, um, we have a, a, a suite, a ERP system called Dynamics. Uh, it's originates from Navision, made from Denmark. But its data source is, uh, is Dataverse. Um, and Dataverse, if you have data in Dataverse, well, we can shortcut that into Microsoft Fabric. So you don't have to make a copy of it. You, ha you actually just have a live connection to your data set in, in Dynamics. So to summarize with all these features, there's less plumbing uh, each time we need to get new data from our different sources. Um, regardless of it ex lives external from our la lake or in databases. And it enables us to do, uh, enable us to deliver the faster analytics and insights to our business. And uh, as an added bonus, it makes, just it makes it easier to infuse analytics with cognitive services and, and open AI, if, if that is something you know about. <coughs> One missed opportunity I, I see a lot, that is people always make their own leg when they're starting to doing their open AI applications. And actually you can, with, with Fabric, you can actually tap into open AI directly with an, uh, with, with an API. You don't have to think about authentication and authorization. Uh, it knows it through uh, identity pass through. Uh, and then there's, uh, let me see in time. I think we'll skip this one, but this is just showing you how to make a shortcut in Microsoft Fabric and how fantastic that is. So, I mean, data in Fabric is also about, uh, it's also where, it's also living there where our business users or our end users are. Uh, we don't have to make any integration efforts to, to get this. This is something we get out of the box. So, you know, our end users are typically using Power BI. Yeah, maybe, I don't know if they're using Power BI, but let's say they use Power BI. They use Excel, they use PowerPoints. These are, they use Teams even, yeah, they even use Teams. So all these places, they will have access to the data, the data in Fabric. So let's see a short video on where, uh, what business users can expect of your data in Fabric. 
one click away, everywhere decisions are made and work gets done. This starts in Microsoft Teams, where the Power BI app makes it easy to discover and collaborate with data. First, I can easily find and open all the reports I have access to right here in Teams. I have all the same powerful and easy to use slice and dice interactivity of Power BI without ever needing to leave Teams. And since Teams is all about collaboration, I can easily embed reports right inside of the channels where my team already works. For example, with this report added to the channel where our sales team collaborates, let me ask Amir a quick question about the data in the report. Immediately he can respond so we can get work done without ever needing to switch context. We can even embed interactive reports inside of meetings so that you can ensure data is on the agenda and easy to discover for everyone every time we meet. Next, in the Teams Data Hub, I can quickly find all of the Analytics VNX data I have been granted access to. Data is recommended for me, and for each data warehouse and lake house, I can see additional information such as endorsements, certification, and sensitivity labels. If I open a specific data set, I can find out more information about the data and quickly get started building my own analysis connected directly to the data. Best of all, with one click, I can get Excel connected directly to the data for self-service. And now in just a few clicks, I can analyze my data with pivot tables directly on top of the one lake data. Notice also the same sensitivity label applied to the VNX data warehouse is automatically inherited by the Excel workbook. This enables organizations to give users more access to data in a trusted and secure way. Finally, discovering and connecting to any additional VNX data in Excel is a snap because I have the same data hub built directly into Excel where I can see the same rich information about my data and get started with new analysis. Next, let's take a look at how we have made interactive reporting fully integrated into PowerPoint. With just a few clicks, I can add any of my reports directly into a PowerPoint presentation. Best of all, this works seamlessly with PowerPoint features like shapes and animations and is fully interactive in presentation mode. This is a great way to not only create interactive data storytelling as part of a presentation, but it saves a ton of time replacing the need to copy and paste charts and manually update weekly or monthly business review decks. These are just a few of the examples of how VNext makes data and insights one click away everywhere decisions are made, and we're incredibly excited to keep empowering everyone with data. So consuming data has never been easier now. It's, not, it's just not a Power BI report. You can do it in Excel. You can do it everywhere. You can do it in Teams. And, and what I especially like about Teams is actually we can have a data-driven talk now about different reports. Whenever I filter or make a selection or click on, on a thing on a report, people can, I can share that link. People will see what I have done. So we can talk about the same things and not guess about what we are talking about. And then Data Activator, our new product. Uh, uh, and Data Vector, uh, in a nutshell, is a sophisticated trigger system. So whenever we receive some data, we can actually make, make a trigger say, OK, well, this data is meeting specific thread, uh, thread, 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 thread points, fresh point, thread, thread holes. Yeah, you get this idea. OK, let's say the temperature is 35, if, if, if it's uh, increases by one uh, degree, well then, or then, then start a, tr uh, a flow that could be send a message to, to, s to a channel in Teams, it could be email, of but uh, it could also be more interesting to, to launch a Power BI automate flow. So we can automate stuff based on uh, our data. Uh, and then uh, again, a little short video. We have IoT sensors that track our packages, our drivers, trucks, that sort of thing. And we want to be alerted in real time when the packages that we're delivering overheat. Now, I've already got some data that's streaming into Data Activator here. In this case, uh, it's coming from Event Hub, but it could just as simply be observations we're making against a Power BI report or a Data Lake or Data Warehouse. I can see the events as they come here, and let's focus on the package delivery events. I see uh, an event count at the top, and this is showing us the overall number of observations of events that are coming in. And then the event timeline is showing us in real time as the latest events get updated. Now, underneath that, we'll also see a table where you can see some of the details. So I can see the, uh, the city name, the number of hours it's been in transit, and crucially, the temperature column, which is what we care about. So we need to tell Data Activator, how do we identify individual packages? What does it mean for a package to be overheating? And then crucially, what do we do as a result of that 
when those packages are too hot. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell Data Activator how do I identify a package. So we need this package ID column here. And we're going to create an object um, using that to get started. So now I can see for my object, I can say, let's come back and add these fields as properties. So I'm going to add this hours in transit property and add my temperature property, which we'll then use further. So see those are on the left hand side here. Let's create a measure on top of this. So the measure lets me do things like aggregating or smoothing out some of those fields. So I'm going to look at the maximum temperature every five minutes. Let's give this a name. And you can see what we're looking at here is a sample of five of those packages. But the selector at the top lets us swap and look at the others. And you can see there are thousands of packages that we're monitoring here. The system will scale up to support this kind of large scale logistics system. So let's create a trigger now. And this is what actually checks the conditions, checks the thresholds that we care about. So I care about when the maximum temperature is greater than 80. And what I want it to do is send me an email um, when that threshold is met. So again, I can see the temperature values here, but underneath I'm actually seeing the number of times this condition would have been met over the last few hours. And in fact, underneath I can see the individual occurrences of when the threshold was breached. And if I select the, the last few of these, what I can do is test this system and test this action to make sure everything's wired up properly. Over in Outlook, I can see it sent me three emails with the object ID, the package ID, uh, and the temperature that was hit when it went over that threshold. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Back here in Data Activator, I've built out this system a little bit more robustly. So I've got more objects and I've added more properties to them. I have things like a driver object on the left-hand side here with a trigger to tell me when somebody's been on their shift for more than eight hours. And in this case, it's not actually sending me an email. The email's going to the appropriate city manager for that specific driver. So you can see in just a few minutes, I've been able to build out a real-time operational alerting system without writing a single line of code using Data Activator. I mean, the concept for making triggers is not new, but now we get uh, a place to do it uh, in the cloud uh, very easily. Um, and one thing I especially like is that we can actually simulate triggers. So it's not like, you know the consequence, you can test out the consequence of your trigger. So you're not spamming your recipient uh, because once that happens, they they don't care, they don't. They will just ignore it. So I, f uh, I think that's a really interesting take on, on how to make triggers now. And of course, AI, how can we t talk about anything without talking about AI? So of course, with co uh, I don't know, Microsoft has something called Copilot and, and that is uh, our GPT. Um, of course, we also have it for Microsoft Fabric and it does a lot of peop uh, things. Um, yeah, let's just, let's just hit the button. Rick empowers you to unlock the full potential of your data. With Copilot integrated into every data experience, Microsoft Fabric lets you use natural language to bring your data to life. From integrating data to writing code to finding insights and creating reports, new transformative AI experiences work alongside you every step of the way so you can stay focused on getting value from your data. Copilot helps turn your words into data flows and data pipelines so you can intelligently integrate data from anywhere. When writing code, Copilot automatically suggests code and easily publish your creations as plugins. And with your data in Fabric, Copilot provides insights and answers everywhere work gets done. Most importantly, Microsoft Cloud runs on trust, which means your data always remains your data. Bring your data into the era of AI with Microsoft Fabric. So I think Copilot uh, is really interesting in, in some ways, and that is because it actually lowers the bar to analytics now. You don't have to be an expert in writing Python or SQL. If you don't, if you don't know, you, if you have the fundamental knowledge of how to work in there, but don't have, don't know exactly how to write it for each loop, you can actually a ask the copilot, and it can hint you on how to do it. So I think that is really interesting. And uh, another point that is traditionally uh, and in fabric, we have we have we operate in different levels of skills, uh, people skills, and that is we have low code for people who are more business users and don't work with the tools every day, then we have no code 
where you don't code at all is drag and drop, and then you have pro code, where yeah, it's 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 by you know, you type code to do stuff. But now we also have another option, and that is talk to the assistant and great stuff, right? I don't know what they will call it, but uh, we have dif we have different options now to do stuff. And I think that's really interesting um, in the era of a a AI. <laughs> and of course, <coughs> then we also have a uh, copilot for Power BI, and that is uh, it's kind of amazing for those who who work with Power BI because sometimes you don't exactly know what you want to achieve with your Power BI report, what what kind of data what kind of insight you want to derive from your data set. And Power BI can actually make some, it can taste on your data and find different trends on it. I, d I don't know if you tried that. It, it was already a feature in Power BI Premium, um, but uh, with GPT, it, it actually improves significantly. Did I say GPT? No, Copilot. Um, I usually don't play this video, but uh, let's try it. Power BI is empowering everyone to quickly find and share insights. For example, say I'm a sales analyst for a hotel and resorts company. Now, with Copilot and Power BI, I can simply describe the report I want to build and get insights in seconds. Maybe we need a new report to help us understand the profile of our customers, to gain insights into what is driving return visits to our properties. I just describe what I need, and Copilot will automatically analyze my data and create a new report based on my needs. Immediately, Copilot created a new Power BI report that is fully interactive, and I can start slicing and dicing my data to explore deeper. Copilot added the charts and slicers I requested, but also conveniently gives me options to adjust the output to get just what I'm looking for. For example, Let's switch to ask for metrics and trends and a slightly different layout. Automatically, Copilot updates the report. Let's go ahead and keep this report page, but it goes much further. I can also ask analysis questions such as, what are the main drivers for repeat customer visits? Copilot responds by adding a new page to my report and uses Power BI's built-in advanced analysis capabilities for finding key influencers for variables in my data. Right away, I can see that customers who purchase spa visits are the most likely to be repeat visitors, followed by those who rented sports equipment. I can easily explore Power BI's key influencer visual further to learn more. I can even automatically see the most significant segments in my data just by clicking. Now let's go back to the first page and finish up our new report. I'm going to ask Copilot to make it look like our existing sales dashboard. Copilot automatically finds and references the dashboard to adjust my report with formatting and layout to match. Best of all, I can still interact directly with the Power BI report Copilot has created. So for example, if I wanted to manually change this line chart to add the reason customers were visiting, it's easy to do with just a few clicks. Let's also change the line chart to a ribbon chart to make the data really stand out. Finally, to make the report even easier for my team to understand, I'm going to ask Copilot to add a rich text description of my data right inside the report. This narrative summary is fully dynamic, and not only does Copilot highlight interesting insights for my data, but it provides citations from where in the report the data was taken. This summary will update every time the data is refreshed, or people filter the report with new insights based on the data. And just like that, in seconds, I've created a report that would have taken hours or days to do manually. Copilot, built on top of Azure Open AI, is truly revolutionary for how we empower everyone to find and share insights. For my first job, my, uh, my re main responsibility was to make 150 pro uh, reports about how our IT portfolio was doing, and uh, I had to dig through all the data, and I had to make an executive summary for each of the report and, and some graphs. Hopefully, uh, the next generation don't have to do that. I mean, a CIO looking at 150 reports, I'm sure you may maybe only look at one or two or three of them. So there was a lot of time wasted there. Yeah, 
you can always say to your manager that it's, it's a co-pilot, not an autopilot. So <laughs> they still need you. It's it's still just yeah. As, as I say, a AI is not a magic wand, right? But for those who are <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for those who have Power BI Premium, did you know you could actually use Fabric? You actually are already paying for Fabric. Did you know that? So those who of those of you who has a P1 SKU, uh, you actually have 64 cores in Fabric, and that actually means that's becoming a bit interesting for for some of the organizations that really cost uh, that that really cares about their cost. And that is because uh, some I if you have unused capacity on your P1, you can actually fill it up with other uh, workloads uh, in, 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 in Fabric. So let's say you, you have this one uh, is your P1 SKU. Then you have uh, ADF, a Azure Data Factory, to, to load data into your platform. And you have maybe a SQL, SQL server or whatever, your Databricks somewhere else also doing transformation and so on on your data platform. You can move that capacity into uh, or these workloads into fabric and then still actually reducing on your cost yeah so that is something uh, you definitely have to think about and that actually sums up what I have on Microsoft fabric uh, it is still fairly new technologies uh, uh, behind the scenes there's nothing uh, really uh, new about it as such uh, relatively speaking but for those who haven't played with fabric you can actually st uh, start yeah learning about fabric it's a, it's a both a tutorial but also a really learning guide explaining you the fundamentals of data warehousing and, uh, and data science, uh, but also why you do certain things uh, in, in Fabric. And then, of course, for those who are a bit hardcore, they can take a certification and say, hey, I'm a certified Fabric for the uh, analysts engineer. Uh, I'm doing that currently. I'm not finished yet. And then, of course, everyone can actually start a trial on Fabric uh, right now, still. Uh, I think you have 60 days of free trial where you get a 64 course, uh, F64 SKU, they call it, where you can play and explore Microsoft Fabric. And that's actually what I have, so uh, feel free to ask difficult questions now. Yeah? Uh, maybe you should f have a mic. Thanks. Uh, when you do the tryout for 60 days, uh, uh, is there any test data that follows along? No. No. Thanks. And I think for, for many of the items, they actually also have different working samples from different industries, so you can get inspired of on how you can do certain things. Hey. When will Fabric uh, support uh, Dynamics FNO? Good question. Um, I don't know what I can officially say <laughs> about that, but I, I can say that the reason that it's not supported right now, that is because the underlying database in FNO is different uh, from the other Dataverse uh, applications. It's running on uh, something that reminds of a SQL database. And the other ones are actually running on a more lake-oriented uh, platform. So that's why we can ingest it or shortcut it directly into Fabric. Mm -hmm. um, so for FNO to work, um, either you have to wait for them to, uh, for Microsoft to convert it um, to a yeah, lake-oriented platform, or else you have to go different routes. Um, I think we have different solutions on that one. Yeah, I think you have uh, this BYOL scenario, bring your own lake mm. alternative versus one lake. Through yeah, uh, and, and um, what is the destination of this? Do you is it a traditional Azure storage? Do you know? Uh, which alternative, BYOL or? Yeah, w and for the destination of, uh, of the solution. Yeah, you want to extract data out of FNO and expose it to different data consumers, Power BI, or 
for integration purpose. Um, you know, there's a lot of integration scenarios that could be implemented around the FNO. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm not unfortunately not super sharp uh, on how you can uh, get the data out of it. I know that they have um, for DataWiz they has this product group, um, but they also have this community w where you can learn about uh, different ways of extracting it. Because once you extract that data, land it in the lake, you are actually uh, really free uh, in, in terms of how you want to use your consume your data. So that that would be my main goal to land it in some data lake somewhere. Yeah, we are currently trying out BYOL scenario, bring your own lake uh, through Synapse Link. Mm -hmm. We export the data uh, and then, you know, we have it exported in Azure storage. We create SQL views yeah. and we expose it that way. But uh, I was under the impression that there was some sort of a timeline for FNO. Uh, oh, oh that, that I don't know, uh, to be honest, uh, that I don't know, but I, I I'll we yeah. But Michael and I, we will figure it out for you. See if we can find some answers in our team. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I have more questions about the warehouse in public. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a virtual warehouse? There is no storage. The old storage is, is in one leg. Yes. It's only compute, I guess. Yeah, so it's, uh, we are separating compute and storage. That's why. It's, it's, it's virtual warehousing. Yes. And uh, I, I was having one another question. You can still do create views on store procedures. You can still do store procedures and views. Yes, you can do and that. How you orchestrate them? Uh, how you orchestrate them? Um, uh, procedure, for example. Huh? The procedures, not the views. Uh, well, you you can do that. Uh, it's just the regular T SQL engine that you know from SQL Server uh, in Azure. Uh, in a, in another platform, so you can do everything you used to do. Um, so yeah, you can just create your views and so on, and consume it as 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 usually with T-SQL, but you can also consume it outside of the data warehouse. For for example, by using a pipeline in in, in data factory in Microsoft Fabric. You can trigger the procedures from the pipeline. You mm. can use data factory to trigger them, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I have one more addressing question. So why you need the warehouse in in Fabric if you can do it without? Because the Fabric can do everything without the data warehouse. Yes, you can certainly do that, and um, I, I I don't think this is an official answer, uh, but I heard that is because if we didn't have a warehouse, people would point fingers at us and say, "Hey, Microsoft Fabric, or oh, Microsoft don't have a data warehouse solution anymore." But uh, but you can you can you can totally do whatever get you can totally achieve the same thing with a, with a lake house also. Do it in the lake. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, for those like me, I, I'm more a SQL guy than a Python guy, and I feel more familiar uh, with that interface and that way of approaching data. So I mean, it, it caters for different audience also. So maybe it can disappear in the future. Hmm? It can disappear in the future if no one uses it. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know if it disappear because we we still have a lot of SQL people. So I would say um, you can bo you can have both, and we are seeing solutions people doing both in their solutions, so it's not either or. I would rather say it's, it depends on the skill of people, uh, uh, because then you cater to different people and, and needs. Um, because sometimes y I think you can achieve something different from each of the different platforms. Because now is the direct lake connection for VI, you don't need the power. The direct, direct lake is, is working for, for both experiences. Thank you, that's all. You're welcome. Uh, just a follow-up question on what you said before with FNO data. Uh, given that now there uh, is a sign-ups link for FNO data via Dataverse, and given that there is mirroring from Dataverse. Yeah, uh, but that only covers everything <laughs> that's not FNO. <laughs> ah, okay, not the FNO mirroring within Dataverse is not covered. Yeah, right. uh, I was also... I, w I was thinking the same when I heard it, uh, and then I approached the team. In a pipeline failure, uh, there is uh, some AI updated, like uh, pipeline jobs, this data is many times failure. So if any notification more. Uh, can you repeat? Yeah, uh, we are data loading in the through pipelines. Okay. Yeah. 
So in a notification, there is a not uh, meaningful for answers, okay? So we need to do more investigations. Is there any new update in this fa fabric that like <laughs> we can identify more easy way? Uh, I mean, uh, mess error messages uh, from Microsoft have never been really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, this way I'm actually. Um, so I'm, I'm, I actually don't know if it will be easier if it you could use Copilot even to uh, to el f yeah. get it to elaborate because I I totally get you. The first thing I, I see is I get a red sign, yeah. and then I, I I expect unexpected error, and then I have to do it manually. Yeah, because uh. there's lots of time to identify the issues. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. And uh, uh, there is a SAP uh, S4 and uh, CDS view. Is it directly connected with Mirror? Um, uh, not. An, an I have not heard that thing. But I know we have uh, connectors to SAP and SAP for HANA uh, in in Microsoft Fabric, okay. as we did also in in Data Factory. Okay. So uh, if those solutions could do it, and Data Factory could do it, then I'm sure Fabric can also do it. Custom con uh, if you could build, it, build custom connectors, uh, I actually have not never got that uh, question before, but I hope you can because I assume you can. Um, else, if you could, uh, if if you c the safe way, the safe answer would be of uh, if you make an Azure function or something that makes an API call, then you can you can call it that way. I actually don't know the platform for uh, for for biz apps uh, if it also uses data voice. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. yeah. As soon as we can get it into the lake, then you don't have to worry about the performance. Uh, but yeah, I I I, d I don't know too much about uh, the dynamics world. World well, promises. I have a question for you, Jeffrey. Oh no. I, I know the answer also. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it called Microsoft Fabric and not Azure Fabric? Oh, if you know that one, I, I've heard that one, and uh, I think that that has to do with the audience they are targeting. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, but 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 please answer that one. That I think it's because I own the domain Azure Fabric. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I hope Microsoft hears this and wants to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, as far as I remember, it has to do with with, with the target audience um, because yeah, it they makes sense to have it called Microsoft and embed all of the ecosystem. Yeah. I think uh, the pizza is here. Oh, nice. Yeah, so uh, we can continue questions while eating pizza and drinking beverages, right? Perfect. Thank you, Jeffrey.